All right. So um, I think we're slowly getting started. You should already see my screen um, on the on the um, the call itself and the format. We're going to do this in um, sort of the first part will be a bit of a presentation, and after that, I'll have a live demo. I will be. Um, I encourage everyone to ask questions in the meantime, though. If you have anything at any point, feel free to, um, to speak up or uh, just post them in the chat and someone from our team will nudge me to make sure that we're going to address them. Uh, the one thing I do want to uh, tell everyone, you will, if you're speaking in the call or you turn on your video, you will be, um, you will be, using, you will be recorded and we will post this publicly uh, at a later point. So uh, please, please um, be sure that you're okay with that. And otherwise, um, I would ask you kindly to uh, leave or not not speak up and turn off your camera. I think Duan was asking whether you can give him host rights. So Sorry. All right. So then let's, let's get started. Um, to start off, we're going to talk a little bit about the upcoming um, release of Tin Lake V3, which um, has been finalized on the code side and it's going to be deployed um, in the coming days. And uh, we'll sort of announce our first asset originators going live with it um, uh, in, in as well shortly. Um, this version is sort of a, a has some significant improvements that uh, we're going to dive into today. Uh, just to not uh, repeat too much of sort of the information we've shared before, uh, we are, I'm, I'm going to give just a very high level overview of what um, Tin Lake is and how it works. There are previous um, community calls where we've sort of introduced the concepts that uh, maybe we can share uh, and tweet about as well, um, just for a reference. So in case or not everything is entirely clear, please um, go and head to one of these recordings. Um, so yeah, so the sort of roughly uh, three topics, just general overview, then um, revolving pool, which is a feature in particular that uh, is um, the focus of this call and then actually a, a bit of a demo on on how these revolving pools work. Um, so besides the revolving pool, which is the main feature, there are, I think, two sort of smaller ones that I want to showcase. Um, there's the EIP 2612, uh, which uh, is called the uh, allow, uh, um, allowance by permit, um, which is a sort of massive improvement over the uh, yep. ERC-20 yep. allowance that everyone knows when you sort of interact with a, with a DAP, yeah. the first step usually is not to actually do the transaction you want to do, but uh, the uh, approving the contract to use your funds. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, KYC with uh, Securitize has become a lot uh, easier. But before that, actually, um, a quick refresher on what Tin Lake is. Uh, Tin Lake is most easily described as like a set of smart contracts that allow um, allow anyone to create a sort of on-chain uh, credit fund. Um, you sort of have three different, sort of three important actors uh, in, in the system. You have the asset originator, the senior investors, and the junior investors. Um, the asset originator's uh, role in this system is to bring in these different kinds of real-world assets, for example, freight invoices or uh, uh, mortgages or streaming revenue, um, tokenize them as a form of an NFT, uh, borrow money from this pool, and then advance it to the 
businesses or end users that are actually need that money. And that is actually usually done in uh, US dollars. So they, they would go to uh, an exchange and convert their, uh, the die that they borrow from the pool into US dollars. The other side of the system, so the investor side, this is sort of the, the drop in tin are two tokens that allow you to earn interest based on this portfolio of, of assets that generate uh, interest from the borrowers. And so these con the tin lay contracts manage the money that flows from uh, borrowers or first from investors to borrowers and then from borrowers uh, back to investors as they repay. Um, the, the special thing about what we do with Tin Lake, and this came, this is what we released in our first, uh, in our sort of second release of Tin Lake, which went out in May when we went live on mainnet, uh, was this two tranche structure. The two tranches means that instead of having like a single ERC20 token that represents a share of this pool, you have two uh, ERC20 tokens. We call them drop and tin. Uh, the drop token is the fixed interest stable um, stable asset that is insured by a variable but usually higher interest junior tranche it sort of provides this uh, buffer so in sort of um, there's, there's sort of two 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 um, instances where this sort of plays in when we have loan repayments so maybe starting on the right side um, so if, let's say we have a fixtures portfolio of $1 million worth of assets. Um, we actually have invest, we, in, we raise money from, so the, the pool raises money from 800,000 in senior investors, so drop token holders, and those, um, and then 200,000 from junior investors. So here we would have a, a TIN ratio, drop to TIN ratio of 20% TIN. Um, that means that when a loan gets repaid, at first, the debt owed to the senior investors is repaid, and only if the uh, if there is any money left for the junior would then the junior investors be uh, actually start earning an interest and start or start making a profit. And so that's why I sort of call this waterfall because sort of money flows from senior to junior, um, and likewise when you um, the, the losses again also sort of first start, start to hit the junior and only if the junior, uh, in, in this case, these 200,000 are not reached, then do the, does the senior get affected? And so this makes it much safer uh, for the senior investor because sort of, if you look at this example, uh, as a senior investor, I actually don't have an impact if, even if 20% of the portfolio is a loss because that would just mean that my senior, uh, that my the junior investors would take a loss, whereas um, whereas if I would if I sort of were to buy a, uh, a shares in the in a junior tranche, that actually means a a, a loss is sort of five times uh, increased, right? A five percent loss on the portfolio is actually a um, a twenty five percent loss on the on my on my uh, my investment. The flip side is that. Um, also, because we're giving uh, the senior investors for this extra security that they get, they're taking a lot less in interest. They're, they're getting a lot less in interest. That means that if the portfolio is doing well as a junior investor, I um, have the potential to make much more. And so this is sort of a bit of an example. We have a lot of information about that and sort of a, a bit of a documentation that I've taken this, uh, these graphics from on our, on our in our developer docs. Uh, maybe actually, Dylan, if you want to post that in the chat, that would probably be helpful. So this is the just general overview on Tin Lake, and so from now on, I'll dive right into the um, into sort of the new features. But uh, before that, if there are if there are any questions, I'm happy to address them right now. There is a question in the chat. Okay, I'm sure. Yeah, and that's the missing time. Um, so you asked, where do the missing 10,000 go? Um, in, in which example here? Ah, ah you, you, spotted a, you spotted a math error in this, uh, in this example, you're right. It should be 50,000 interest here, 50,000 interest and not. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so sorry about that. 
embarrassing, but I'll, I'll make sure to correct that mistake. Um, yeah, so when you look at a pool, so there are four different kind of operations that can happen. A pool is a rough sort of in a high level description that if you have these originations, which means the asset originators are adding new loans to the pool and borrow die with it, giving it to the borrowers um, or their loan repayments. When these, when these loans mature, then uh, there's money flowing back into the pool. And then you have uh, drop and tin investors, both sort of being able to supply liquidity uh, or to redeem some of their pool shares for, for, um, for, for, for stable coins. So in most cases it's DAI. Um, and so um, sort of the revolving pool is around how actually these uh, investors um, are able to interact with this pool. Um, to date, if you look at tinlake.semifuge.io, this is a screenshot. Um, you see that, for example, console freight is already on their a third series of, um, of, of, of pools. This means that they did, um, they originated 280,000 DAI with their first one, then they did 337,000 in the second one. Um, the third one currently is, is still going. Uh, here it's uh, 202,000 DAI are outstanding, 50,000 have already been repaid. But so, so how this works or how the version two of Tin Lake worked was that sort of once you've invested the capital once uh, and it has been repaid, there's no more, there's not really an option for, uh, for you to reuse it. And at the same time, if, you're, if you haven't invested sort of before the capital started getting deployed, there is no way for you to buy into the pool at a later point in time. And so this is what we're sort of addressing with, um, with revolving pools. Uh, there, are, um, there are sort of two secret ingredients that um, we, we need for that. Uh, the, this is first of all having a, an accurate uh, calculation of the net asset value, and I'll go into a bit more detail. And the other thing that we need is uh, automated rebalancing of the pool. So meaning managing in an automated way, managing investor demand, borrow demand, uh, and, and sort of repayments and uh, redemptions. And so, I'll, and this is what the, the conversation will be about today mostly. Um, I hinted at uh, some of the other uh, good stuff that's coming. So EIP2612 uh, uses uh, a function on the, is an extension to the ERC20 token contract by which you can sign a, a, uh, a message, cryptographically sign a message with your key to allow uh, a, to basically approve a contract on your, on your uh, transaction. Uh, and then what you do is instead of separating, uh, separately submitting this transaction to, uh, to the chain, you pass on this signed message to the contract that you actually want to call. And then that contract can get the, get, get the uh, permit or the sort of the approval for this transaction within the same transaction. And so that actually um, makes it significantly safer because sort of what you see when you use a lot of these DeFi protocols is actually that they uh, require you to, usually the default in the implemented in the front ends is just that you approve for, a, for the maximum amount, basically an unlimited approval. And at that point, the contract can interact with your, you, with your tokens or your die balance or your drop token balance. Uh, continuously, however they, however they want. So if there was an issue with the contract, a security issue, a flaw that could be used to trigger more, um, to trigger more transactions that would take die from you, for example, then you're, you're not protected. Uh, with the, per and so the contracts have been doing these, or front ends have been doing these unlimited approvals, mostly because the user experience is extremely bad if you don't do it, because if you don't do it every time actually when you want to interact with a contract that needs to access your DAI uh, or your, your, to your ERC-20 token, you first have to submit a transaction that approves the contract for a specific amount. And then you need to wait for that trans transaction to be mined and then prompt the user to sign another transaction to uh, then spend them, uh, actually execute the transaction. 
um, with gas prices extremely high or people like picking the wrong gas price, this could mean there's like maybe a, like you suddenly get, you have to wait 10 minutes by that time, like you should, you, people have gotten tired of doing, of, of waiting in front of the screen. And so then like you, you obviously lose, um, you lose a lot of time in that. Um, and so we'll actually see sort of how this works uh, at, when I demo it. Um, this is a relatively new standard, but it's been, it's gotten quite a good adoption. Um, so Uniswap in the version that went live um, um, now has this by default for liquidity provider token. Um, DAI sort of was actually the first token that this was developed for um, that went live um, uh, last last year, it's slightly technically it works slightly differently, but um, more or less the same. Chai is also a, a DSR enabled version of Dai, and so for anyone who's thinking of implementing ERC twenty tokens, I highly recommend you to check it out. Um, it's sort of the best meta transaction and sort of approval uh, solution. But yeah. Um, so sort of other improvements, and this is mostly for the people in the call that have been using our very early version of the V2 UI uh, over the last couple of months. Um, we've significantly improved it. Um, and so there are things like um, sort of a, an up-to-date overview of just what's going on in the pool. And, and I'll walk through this um, in, the, in the demo later. Um, there's also another feature, and this is something we recently announced. Um, a lot we've sort of partnered together with Securitize, a KYC AML provider, and uh, just in general, um, um, they allow all of these asset originators that we work with today to sort of plug in um, sort of an onboarding and KYC experience that is uh, extremely easy and sort of high quality, takes care of your uh, privacy and, um, and sort of is, is legally uh, top notch. And so that uh, reduces a bit of the, the pain of uh, having to go through getting, getting KYC with different pools, getting um, sort of your documents together. They have, I think they have a pretty good process. I won't be able to demo this today, but um, if you're interested, actually the first step you can do it today, if you go to Tinlake uh, Centrifuge.io will be um, when we launch this to actually go through it yourself and just sort of see. Um, so yeah, now I want to talk about revolving pools, so which I've hinted at enough times now. Um, the, and I'm coming back to the slide that I showed before, uh, these two secret ingredients. Um, and it needs, um, it needs a bit of an explanation of the economics behind the pool. But when you go from uh, closed end pools where everyone deposits the money up front to revolving pools, you need to be able to predict the or sort of to determine the price that a new investor needs to pay for a drop token or a tin token. Sort of today, so the tin token and drop drop token sort of they they work in a way that um, there's a value at which you buy it, and then the value sort of of the token goes continuous continuously goes up as you accrue interest on it, and then you sort of redeem it, um, then you get your your uh, your return your principal plus return. And so that means over time, as this value goes up, I need to be able to buy uh, this, this token um, at the right price. The, the Tinlake smart contracts need to know how, at what price they should allow a user to buy more tin or more drop. And so the sort of the value of the, so you need to know what is the value of the pool so you can know what is the value of the senior tranche and what is the value of the junior tranche. And um, so in, in, uh, fi in the financial world, uh, this is called the NAV, the net asset value. Sort of a, a very broad description of it is just, um, it looks at the sum of all loans in the pools. Um, it sort of um, adds up the, the outstanding principal plus the expected interest revenue. Um, and then it factors in some rate of default depending on the different risk of these assets and just dis uh, um, dis uh, discounts that. And then you sort of arrive at, if you were to liquidate the pool today, sort of if you fast forward to the future, then um, this is the value of the token today. That's the first feature. Um, the second feature is that uh, in sort of the way Tinlake V2 pools worked, asset originators would raise money to um, 
have the, I made the example with console freight, have the 275,000 die, um, 278,000 die ready at um, investment time, get everyone to pay in, um, and then um, sort of deploy that capital over time. This is of course very a, a coordination system, a coordination game that you don't want. We instead want that sort of as demand for assets grow, investors can just join and uh, as, or as an investor wants to redeem, we can either use other liquidity in the reserve or new investments coming in or loan repayments to repay those investors that want to sort of leave the pool. And so this is this automated rebalancing of the pool with best effort fulfillment is sort of covers this um, aspect. Um, on the NAV calculation, I will go, uh, I will try to keep it as high level as, um, as this. Um, it's, it's a bit of a, a tricky graphic and it warrants its own uh, call and probably blog post series that will be that we are writing and publishing more. But um, so what you do when you look at a set of loans or a, a, a portfolio is what we have here. Um, we have here three loans that are being repaid, um, one in 30 days, one in 60 days, and one in 90 days. So these are sort of our future cash flows. Um, what we want to know is what the present value of these loans is. And so we arrive at this present value by first taking a look at the principal and debt today, adding the expected revenue that is the interest that the borrowers pay on top. So that's the um, that's sort of the the blue part. Then we actually look at the risk rating. So each asset sort of gets assigned a um, risk score that determines the interest rate that they pay, which will be higher, the higher the risk score is. And also the um, expected loss, which is um, the probability of default. So the probability that sort of we model um, or the asset originator models to at which the asset might not be repaid. And then the, the uh, loss given default, the loss given default is just if the borrower doesn't repay, how much do we think can we realistically recover? So for so the, the practical scenario using an invoice as an example, uh, the probability of default is just what's the chance that the, you, the borrower will not pay back on time? And then the second number is in, if, if they don't pay back on time, how much do we think can we recover by, for example, going to bankruptcy court and sending a collecting agency, for example, after them? And so you might say there's a 2% chance of probability of default. And in case we, um, in case we do a, uh, in case there is a default, then maybe you are able to recover 50% on average. So then you would basically have a 2% um, times 50, which would be 1% uh, uh, expected loss. So for example, so if you're, if you're invoice now, pays 2% in interest, but has an expected loss of 1%, now you have like sort of a profit of, of one. And so that's, that's then the, uh, doing this across the entire portfolio of loans, then takes, um, and then adding that up to sort of what you have today in the portfolio gives you um, the, the NAV. One thing that I won't go into, but um, sort of what we do is we discount cash flow based on the net present value. So in sort of in finance, there's, I mean, there, there is this um, concept that of course, cash today is worth more than cash in two years. And so this is sort of the, the, um, the discount rate is basically what you're saying. The, because these revenues are far out in the future, you can just assume all of that is profit. You need to actually um, discount it by some because waiting, uh, waiting for these cash flows to come in, come in of, course, of course costs you money. Um, so that's um, the, the high level calculate, um, description of sort of what the NAV model looks. And there's a, um, yeah, which, so the question is which participant in the system is responsible for risk assessment? Um, the risk assessment fi um, it, it finally will come from underwriters. Um, this proportion today is done by the asset originators according to a sort of a risk matrix that they sort of 
present to the investors as well, sort of as anyone who wants to look at it, saying, for example, um, if you were to advance money to, or if you were to pay, pay loans to uh, consumers in the US, for example, an, an, an asset originator would just say, I would give anyone with a credit, and I'm overly simplifying here, everyone with a credit score of under 600, we're gonna give a risk category of three, uh, over, over six, between 600 and 650, it's gonna be two, and between 650 and 700, it's, it's three. And then, so sort of based on that, then the credit model in the NAV sort of has these fixed uh, very, uh, uh, sort of parameters, the probability of default and the loss given default, and that's sort of like what uh, you need to look at. Um, in reality, sort of these models, we've, um, the asset originators either like develop themselves based on past loan origination history that they have experience in, um, and, uh, or sometimes we've seen asset originators also working with sort of underwriters um, paying them for these models. And um, in some cases, actually, we've seen underwriters even sort of participating and in investing in the pool and help, helping out with that. Um, there is sort of one thing talking a bit about what's coming in the future and sort of maybe what we could, we'll, we'll call Tin Lake V4. Um, the idea is actually that um, the Tin token holders will become part of um, setting these risk scores. And that is something that uh, we've sort of published an early idea on in our um, community discourse uh, forum that uh, maybe, yeah, you want to uh, post in the chat. Um, go check it out. And I, we absolutely should do a call on sort of how this system will evolve. Um, and so I'll, uh, yeah, I would say you'll have to wait until then for, uh, for diving more in detail there. Um, so yeah, I, I will be able to skip that. So the other, um, so the other thing we need, right, is we, we now have like these pools are structured much more flexibly. It means that investors can join anytime, investors can leave anytime, asset originators can originate more loans, uh, asset originators can, can repay loans. And so there needs to be this way that we manage these orders. Um, because these real world assets are much less liquid and sort of change value much less frequently, um, it doesn't just make sense to like do an auction or like something uh, like that to sort of have dynamic pricing of the pool. It simply would be probably lead to too many auctions where not enough interested parties are available. Um, it's, it's much more modeled after like what a traditional credit fund would do or, or like a mutual fund does as well, where um, sort of over a set period of time, a lot of funds in the traditional financial world do this on a monthly basis. Um, we actually, um, while this is configurable, how long our epochs are, um, we aim, I think we're gonna do sort of, the, a lot of the early pools will have an epoch the size of the, the length of about a day. Um, so in that period, sort of we collect orders. So that what we call orders would be investors that wanna reinvest, uh, sorry, invest more, investors that wanna redeem, um, both from the junior and the senior Trump, so both TIN and drop investors. And then we also have um, loan repayments that come in during that time. And so we look at these three, um, these three transactions, right? I actually sort of going back a bit to this, um, to this slide here, right? So these are all of these actions that can happen during this epoch. Um, we sum them, sorry, we sum them all up um, and then we execute the order um, sort of once a day. And sort of at that point, we see how much uh, can be added, how much can be repaid. And so to give you like a few uh, simple examples, um, if, uh, if there are, um, say you have an investor that wants to invest a uh, thousand die and you have a different investor that wants to redeem 2000 die worth of drop. Um, and there's nothing else happening in the pool during that epoch, no loan repayments, uh, no other investors that want to join. Then what would happen is that the investor that wants to redeem would be able to get, uh, 50% of their redemption in the first epoch, and maybe in this, their, their, order, their remaining sort of redemption, the remaining thousand die um, would be um, still sort of a pending order. And so let's assume in the next epoch, the asset originator repays a loan, 
uh, that would mean um, maybe 2,000 are, are, are repaid. That would actually now mean that at, when we uh, execute the second epoch, um, the, the, uh, there's a, a surplus of 1,000 die because you still have 1,000 die that want to leave the pool. You had 2,000 die that came into the pool during that time frame. And so now you're left with all of the epoch, uh, all of the orders being executed and um, the, the, uh, uh, the asset originator actually, or sort of the pool reserve, still having a thousand die left because that was the surplus coming from the loan repayment and what was left after giving out money to the investors. So with that, with that thousand die in the reserve, the, um, the asset originator could originate another loan. And so, um, I feel I've used sort of these two examples um, as just sort of very basic um, events. Of course, this now as this as this scales, uh, there can be many loan repayments within one period. Many different investors. Some of them could want part of their money back. Some of them could want to increase their investment. Some um, some might want to invest there. So there's like this uh, set of constraints. And sort of this epoch at the at this order execution that we've um, that is basically a, a set of rules in in the smart contract sort of optimizes for the optimal outcome that makes everyone um, that sort of that satisfies these constraints in the in investor you obviously always get priority as a junior investor you only get your money um, back if you're uh, if all of the senior investors have been paid out and after all of these uh, redemption requests have been made is then uh, money available for the asset originator uh, to originate new loans and so this results in basically uh, the investors having a, a, a pretty decent li liquidity in these assets and as long as there's demand for this pool sort of as long as investors want to invest in this pool um, the asset originator continuously has new money coming in that they can originate. Only if sort of the investor sentiment switches to them generally wanting to leave, would the pool slowly shrink as these uh, assets are being paid and the money would not be made available to the asset originator to um, originate. Um, are there any questions? Um, I have actually two questions here. Yeah. How do we deal with credit default? So, um, yeah, so question how we deal with credit default risk when the senior is underwater. Uh, when the senior is under, so sort of if you go back to the NAV model, right, our NAV model sort of predicts what the expected cash flows are. And let's say the value of the NAV goes down and repayment and sort of the, the, the pool now says that even though we should have a million dollars uh, in loans come, being paid back, we only have 750. That means that TIN investors can't get anything out anymore at all because, well, they're, they're already completely wiped by that time. The, the, for the senior, then, of course, there is a, a loss, and that, that's something that, that's in the, on, the, on the borrower side. Or maybe we'll talk about what, what happens on the borrower side first, actually, because that, that's important. Um, of course, just that there is a, a delay in payment doesn't mean that this, so we just accept this loss, right? The asset originators have like a, have loan servicers, they have sort of a process to go after any delinquent payments. And so they will do their sort of the SPV that is sort of behind this, in, in this pool is sort of legally obliged to do its best effort to recover any of the outstanding loans. Um, as time goes on and maybe you realize, well, some of these investments really were bad, um, you, you at some point you, re you can't recover. At that point, um, sort of is when, when only when the senior investors right, would start, well, when, when the, the loss is sort of um, realized. So what happens in the meantime is actually as more and more drop investors want to redeem, everyone would get their pro rata redemption back. So if we have 800,000 uh, drop dollars in drop, in, in, in debt that we owe towards the, the uh, drop investors, but there's, there's only maybe 750,000 coming back, then that means everyone gets, um, 
uh, everyone gets, uh, what is it, uh, once uh, 15 sixteenth of their, um, of their investment repaid. And so this happens over time as these loans are being paid back, except for the loans that are obviously del delinquent. These NFTs, these loans would stay in the system. And while they don't have any value anymore, they technically still have a debt. And then if at any point in time, um, say a year later, you're able to get money from the, the person that uh, owed that, that money, then that, that debt can now be repaid and sort of your remaining one sixteenth of drop tokens that you haven't been able to redeem, you could then use to get the money back. Um, that's sort of what would happen in the worst case default scenario. Um, so can drop investors take individual legal action or does it need to go along with, syndic with the syndicate of funders? Um, the drop investors can't take legal action against um, the, the individual borrowers, but it can force the SPV to take legal action against the individual borrowers. Uh, the SPV is required to repay the, uh, the investors. And so the way it is required to do that is by collecting payment from the, from the borrowers. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll um, sort of dive into demo a bit about how this um, works, but sort of just as in sort of talking about these epochs, uh, we'll see it in a bit. Um, but so sort of what you can see here are these different orders that people have committed to already, redemptions, uh, investments. You have the minimum epoch duration, so how long we do these epochs, then how much. This is going to be a test environment. So we, we're using fake die. We're using uh, a one minute epoch so that I can show this to you very quickly. And, um, and then I'll, I'll sort of show you how, what this looks like on Kovan. So let me set up my screen. So, so I have um, I have three accounts on this on this wallet. I have. Um, I have Alice, uh, Bob, and Charlie. Alice and Bob are both investors. Um, Charlie is the asset originator. And so what I first want to show you is I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to the DAP on um, with Charlie's account. This is, this is Charlie. Um, we have three, we have three, well, we have three pools here just sort of to test, but this is sort of the new revolving pool that I'm going to show you today. Um, I see here, this is sort of the pool overview with, and this is still low, loading and fear is a bit slow today, um, where you can see sort of the different assets that are backing this pool. You see just how much the supply is. You can see the minimum tin risk buffer. This is the minimum tin ratio. You can see how much is currently in the tin. So you can see that tin investors committed a lot more capital than, than uh, the drop investors. And you can see that uh, the drop APR is uh, 6%. So as an investor, I get to this view. Um, and I can see that um, a few things that I talked about in the presentation before. Uh, the pool value, this is um, this is calculated live on chain. Um, this is sort of composed by the NAV, which is all of the loans according to the NAV, NAV model that I uh, explained. And then the reserve, the reserve is the money that hasn't been deployed yet. So that's money that's in the pool, but is not generating interest from borrowers yet. Um, and so that's, and, and then you can see the outstanding debt owed by borrowers which is, as you can see, slightly more than uh, what the NAV is, because in the NAV, we've sort of discounted this with a bit of a, a chance of default. Um, on, the, on the other side, and in a in testing environment, right, we've set the minimum TIN to 10%. We've set the maximum TIN, and you set these, these parameters are sort of set when uh, you deploy the contracts. 
Um, so the maximum here is set at 100%, the minimum is set at 10%, and the current ratio is 56%. Um, so you can see there's uh, a tin value of 670 and a drop value of uh, 540. Um, so, so you can see sort of how this, how this is um, evolved or how this is composed. Um, and so as Alice, um, now I can show you a few things. Alice wants to invest in a senior tranche. So she goes and invests um, 500 die. Um, I, can, I see here, I have a million die, so that's gonna work. Great, so uh, first thing I wanna do here is I'm gonna lock my die. And you'll see here, instead of the usual ERC20 approval, that is actually a separate transaction, I sign a message uh, that says, I, Alice, am approving the spender, that is actually the contract that runs this pool, to um, take 500 uh, die, right? 500 with the usual 18 digits of precision. So, um, so this is not an infinite approval and actually the maximum amount of die I can ever lose with this is 500 because the die contract ensures that I can never take more than that in this transaction. Uh, this, the deadline just means that it never expires. So I sign this and I can see immediately after it, do, it doesn't go on chain, it's just a signature. And what I now do is I submit uh, the transaction, right? So I don't have this waiting, um, this waiting for, uh, for Ethereum to sort of mine this transaction first. This is actually the contract interaction that then deposits it. So that creates my, uh, my order. Uh, so now we have, a, we have one transaction pending and now it was mined. Well, this was this one. Um, and now I see I have a, an order locked. Uh, I have 500 um, uh, die and I should get 500, 500 drop and 34 cents at the current value um, um, for it. So now I'm gonna switch my account to Alice, uh, to Bob, sorry. Uh, and Bob is gonna invest some as well. So I'm now Bob, uh, I go to the investments page. Um, I'm, Bob is actually gonna do something different. Bob is gonna take, uh, it's gonna invest 200 in drop, uh, same permit approval and um, drop. Bob also wants to feels luck feels like he wants a bit more yield and is willing to risk some of his money um, at with the potential of higher yields. So Bob is also doing 200 die in tin. So again, I need to sign a approval to allow the uh, the junior tranche to take some of my die 200. Um, I execute that. I, I submit the transaction. I now see that I have two of these, uh, uh, when it refreshes, two of these uh, orders. Um, let's see if this updates. Uh -huh. Yeah, now, now it updated, good. Um, so, so also helpful, um, everyone knows how to, um, how annoying it is to add tokens to ethers, to etherscan, uh, sorry, to MetaMask. Um, I actually already did this, but um, there's a small helper here. You can say add token to your wallet, which will request you, um, which will tell you to add a suggested token. So then doing this will make it show up in this list. So I now have this uh, zero eight drop and 31 tin are, are our two test tokens. What you can see though, is actually, if you look in here, both Bob and Alice, they don't actually have any drop yet. Um, and that is because the order hasn't, has been executed, but um, I still need to collect my drop. And so um, you can see here, it, this was actually able to fulfill the entire transaction. So I'm getting, um, I'm getting 199.886 drop and I'm giving the entire die amount to the pool. Um, if I would, 
if only say half was um, if only half was uh, executed, then for example, um, the you would get when you call collect, you would get some of the die back that you've locked up and a rem and a and an amount of drop that corresponds to the remainder. So now I've I've collected my drop. Um, so you can see them here, and I'm also going to collect my tin, um, and I'm going to do the same thing for for Alice. Um, just to make sure. So I'm back in Alice's account. Um, I should see here. Um, Alice invested 500, so I can collect uh, 500. And so now we have um, we have uh, in a bit when it's mined, we should see the the state. Also, what's so let what, let's see what changed here. Actually, um, what changed here is that the reserve went up, and the reserve is the amount of money that is available for the asset originator to borrow. Um, so the reserve, it was nine, it was about 90 die before, now it's 900 die, right? The 400 that Bob invested and the 900 that Alice invested. Um, so you also can see that the tin buffer actually moved a bit to the right because uh, we actually had more senior investment than junior investment. Um, what I now want to show is uh, going into um, Charlie's account. Um, I'm going to play the role of the asset originator. Now that there is uh, money in the um, in the tranche, or sort of in the reserve to be to borrow, I'm now Charlie, and Charlie sort of opens a financing. I've already created, I've already minted this NFT here. It's sort of the price pricing and the risk group have been set on it. So I can open the financing, which will uh, lock the NFT in the pool. Um, so that's the first step. And uh, then the second step when this is mined is, uh, one second. Wait for this to refresh. No, actually, I need to. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so now I can see this is the asset that I added. Um, I have um, I have eight hundred available to borrow. Um, it has a seven point five percent financing fee. Um, it's going to be repaid on the thirtieth of November. Um, so uh, I want to. Uh, I'd say. I don't want to borrow 800, I actually only want to borrow 500. Uh, so I'm going to say finance this asset, um, which will um, make 500 die appear on my um, wallet. Stupidly enough, I don't have to die, our dummy die that we're using here in MetaMask, but um, um, you can see here, um, if I now look at the pool overview, um, the reserve was reduced by 500 and the uh, outstanding volume was increased a bit. The uh, NAV has changed as well. Um, so now I'll just show you the last thing, which is uh, let's assume in the same epoch, Alice actually wants to redeem some of their drop because she needs, um, needs the capital. So I'm gonna go back to uh, Alice. Um, I need to reload the pool. I go to the investment tab um, and I say now I have 499 drop, which is worth 500 die right now. As interest accrues by the loans that are in this pool, this will increase, but uh, given, it, given the interest hasn't changed, much, this is 500. Um, so let's say Alice wants to redeem 250. Um, I lock the drop tokens and I place the order. 
so you can see I do the signature and then I do the, the confirmation. And so now I have this transaction pending, um, which you'll see uh, when it's mined, you'll see here that now in the epoch, there is a redemption. It's still, it's still, uh, it's still loading, so it will take some time. Um, now it'll take some time to refresh this part of the UI, but yeah, now, so we have it, we have like the pending redemptions and sort of when the minimum epoch duration has, like, has uh, happened, uh, which will should happen momentarily, um, I should be able to see that, um, first of all, I can, uh, well, until the epoch is over, I could cancel the order. When the epoch is finalized, then actually um, it has been executed. Uh, let's just reload this. And um, so one second, actually. Here I have I have 204. I was able to settle 249 drop for 250 die. Um, so I'm doing this, and now I am. Um, so actually, I wanted 250 back, but I um, I got a bit more. That's because there's interest um, that was generated, and so now the maximum reserve already went down because of course this money now is owed to Alice. Um, and you can see sort of that we have the 240 in the reserve. We have the 1600 as outstanding debt. And, um, and you see sort of what's, what's going on in the pool here. Um, so yeah, that's, that concludes the demo. Um, so I wanna uh, go back to I think there's just one slide, um, which is, huh, I forgot to add the link here. Um, so there's a Kovan deployment uh, as well. There is a um, the URL for the mainnet, which mainnet deployment, which will go live um, in a few days. It's going to be. Um, See, I'm just refresh. It's going to be tinlake.sanyfuture.io, quite easy. Um, so this is where you'll be able to see it and use it and uh, play it, play well, play with it and, and start hopefully investing in some of these pools that are going live. Um, yeah, so we have a we have a few more minutes for q and I'm happy to go over a bit. Um, please don't be shy to just jump into the microphone, uh, jump and grab the microphone and, and uh, talk or uh, post in the chat. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, first question, um, which asset originators will launch with new pools when Tinlake V3 goes live? We're going to, uh, these asset originators are going to roll out uh, in, in phases, but um, I can say that uh, console freight is going to be the first one um, going live next week. Um, I think we're going to announce this. Um, so, that and then there's going to be more. Um, a lot of the ones that we're working with, as a lot of the ones that have done um, closed end pools with us, obviously are very, are very much excited about doing uh, these revolving pools, which will then um, have a longer, uh, a longer, much longer lifetime, potentially unlimited lifetime, and uh, will also grow significantly in size. Uh, the second question: What's the process for becoming an originator? Um, so, so I have two answers here. Um, first of all, like all of like the technology, the, the, the framework, these contracts that we've built, um, you can just start using them and, um, and, and play with the product and you could potentially just do that. Of course, um, sort of there's a lot of uh, heavy lifting around things that isn't just code. There's the credit model, there's the legal setup um, and all of that. Um, 
we've been very um, happy to work with asset originators so far that um, sort of have been collaborative with us on with with us on sort of developing these pools. So if you're interested, if you have an idea for an asset that you an asset class that you really want to see, or like you have assets yourself, um, like a good start would just be to reach out to one of us and um, and sort of go through this, and then we'll look at okay, like. Obviously, we need to make sure that these pools are safe, that the credit model works, that the NAV model um, is, is correct. Determine the price for the drop token, look at the characteristics for the TIN token. Um, and, and then that sort of is sort of are the first couple of uh, steps. Um, Any other questions? Things people want to say? Anything I can exa um, uh, explain? Um, I'm not asking if we help uh, to drive capital to um, originators. Um, yes, this is something we're doing. Um, Obviously, we need to make sure there's there are plenty of asset originators in this ecosystem that we're building, and there are plenty of investors that are interested in investing. If there's a mismatch, mismatch on, on both on, on either side. Um, neither side would be happy. Um, we have announced a um, reward program where we award uh, radial for liquidity providers as well as asset originators that incentivizes some of these early users with. Um, Radial token, the radial token I haven't talked about in this um, in this talk, and it would go out of the scope. But that's the utility and governance token for the the whole system. Um, that is one thing we're doing. Um, the other thing, um, and probably quite a few of you 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 um, people in this call know us from our work with the Maker community or with the Ave community. Um, a large, interesting source of liquidity is actually. Uh, when you think about investors, not just as humans or legal entities that are investing, but um, of course there are DeFi protocols that can be interesting sources of capital. And so we're working both on um, getting these assets added as collateral, approved as collateral on Maker, and we're actually launching a money market together with Aave. Well, we're, we're proposing to the community that we're doing that, and, and I hope we sort of get the support from them which will be a dedicated Aave money market where uh, investors can then invest in, instead of sort of cherry picking individual pools, you'll sort of get the experience, the, the, the convenience of investing in a general purpose money market for real world assets and sort of the liquidity will be automatically managed and sort of moved around between these different pools as, uh, as demand and, and supply changes. So those are the, the things we are doing. Um, we also have um, quite a few uh, investors already that have sort of expressed interest, always, always looking more. I think if you're sort of interested in playing around with real world assets in DeFi, sort of getting the first experience here. Um, if you want to diversify your crypto risk, but you don't want to leave crypto, um, you want to earn like these assets generally are, are interesting because they're very stable, um, but still have, have, an, have an interest. Uh, right, whereas, for example, DAI with the DSR is basically at zero, um, and you need to start looking at ways to uh, to to uh, generate yield in other ways if you want sort of stable um, capital. Cool. Um, are there any other questions? Um, So what are your thoughts on making this deal composable within DeFi? It being a security would be an ob obstacle to composability. Um, the, the, it is a security if you buy it as an individual or a legal entity. We have um, a legal setup that we've been documenting and sort of engaging, and there's a lot of work on, in the maker community that uh, you can look at that sort of talks about how you can make these uh, sort of regulated instruments uh, still compatible. And um, we have received positive feedback from the maker community. Actually just today, um, 
our MIP 22 and so maker improvement, improvement proposal MIP 22 and our sort of general um, outline of what our plan is for bringing these assets onto maker MIP 13 sub proposal five. Um, those have been approved by the uh, maker community. So there was an on chain uh, vote sort of indicating um, indicating that those are ways that the community think we should proceed. Um, and that this does go into, into detail a bit on, on the legal and sort of how this process works. So uh, head over to like the maker forum to look at it. But yeah, obviously, um, and that's, I think just sort of speaking to the mission of Semifuge and the idea of Tin Lake is that, well, by creating these assets on chain, um, we need to be composable with DeFi. If we were not, if this was sort of our completely separated walled garden, uh, we would be adding very little to this ecosystem. In fact, we would just be creating a separate ecosystem that probably doesn't warrant even being on Ethereum because at that point um, you miss out on, on the openness on, on this ecosystem. And so it's a very important part of our strategy and, uh, and I think a big motivation for us to make it composable and bring real world assets to these other projects as well, right? Like Maker needs uh, diversified collateral and for these asset originators can, um, can actually fill that need. Yeah, cool. Thanks everyone for the questions. Um, we will be sharing the slides, uh, maybe along with a few links of the doc, I'll add a slide at the end, uh, with a few links on, um, on the references we've made in the call, as well as a recording on YouTube uh, that we'll link in our discourse forum. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to see some of you, some of you, or as many of you as possible to uh, start playing with um, or start investing in these assets. Um, and start sort of using the system. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you. Have a good one.